lots of guests um, with us today. And I want to introduce Cheryl Strong, who is a biologist from the Don Edwards um, San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge. And then I also wanted to introduce a large contingent from the San Francisco <laughs> Bay Bird Observatory, SSBDO, and you'll see why that's important in just a minute. But we have Dave Thompson over here, Pat Burns, and we have Josh Scullin, and Kristen Butler, Wei Wang, our new executive director. And who else is here? Oh, Idona, and oh, and a Korean companion, <laughs> and also Miranda Miller. And, oh. David. I think it's you. Yeah. 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 Long list. One thing you might, and also Ben is working um, as a BDO. So one thing you might notice about this is that many of the folks who work for SFBDO are also my students, or were my students, which is so great. I, I owe a great debt of gratitude to SFBDO for all the help that they have given my students over the years, and I hope that we are returning that help with, um, with our wonderful students. So uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ben Pearl. Uh, who is defending his thesis today. And he's done a wonderful thesis working with the Western Snowy Plover, which is a difficult little bird to work with. Um, it's very small, hard to see, but there are some huge questions about this bird, which is a threatened species. Um, ben came to us from UC Santa Cruz. In 2012, he joined the program. He said he took some courses with us in 2011, which let him know that this was the right place, and I'm so glad he did come here. So he came to us in 2012 and is finishing here, which in 2015, which is blindingly fast. Yes, it's, it's so great. It's pretty, he picked his topic and ran with it. And that is, is um, it's really great. That's very hard to do. As you know, our, um, all of our grads do so. Um, I remember when Ben came into the program and he was searching for a topic and he was in my lab. You worked for some company. Right, you were working for you had a pretty good job for, actually. For a yeah, right. And he's just like, well, this is not where I want to be, and so I'm going to make a change. And the in, the yearly internship for SFEDO came up, and he said that's what I'm going to do. So he left a pretty lucrative job to be an intern for <laughs> SFEDO, <laughs> and it's been great ever since. So <laughs> came up with a really wonderful topic that he is going to tell you about today. I'm extremely proud to um, be the thesis chair for Ben Pearl. Welcome. Well, uh, I wanted to thank everyone for coming out today. My name is Ben Pearl. Um, so today, basically, I'm going to give you an overview of my uh, thesis work. And basically what I looked at is factors that affected the winter foraging habitat selection of western snowy plovers uh, here in South San Francisco Bay Ponds. So first, uh, just a quick outline for you guys. We're going to go into some background information about snowy plovers. Next, we're going to get into some literature review, looking at snowy plovers as well as other shorebirds. After that, we'll get into the research questions and hypotheses that I had for this project. Next, we'll move into the research methods that I used for my project. Afterwards, we'll get into the data analysis and results that I found. And finally, we'll get into the discussion and recommendations from this. Oh, wrong way. So first, just a little bit of information about western snowy plovers. Uh, they're a small ground nesting shorebird. They're about 15 to 17 centimeters in length and about 34 to 58 grams. Um, if you can see in this picture right here, this is the snowy plover, and this is a western sandpiper. So if any of you are familiar with western sandpipers, very small, kind of give you an idea of just how small a uh, snowy plover is. Um, snowy plovers generally lay about three eggs per clutch um, on the ground, and they're kind of unique in the fact that they have a polyandrous mating system. So females will actually abandon the male and the chicks several days after they hatch, move on to find another mate, and start a new nest. So kind of a unique situation. Um, there's two distinct populations of western snowy plovers. One that's found along the Pacific coast, and this is from southern Washington down to Baja, California. And then also there's an interior population that's found um, in the interior part of California, Oregon, Washington, as well as the uh, Great Salt Lake area in northwest Texas. They're semi-migratory species. So what this means is that 
Uh, some of the birds, especially along the Pacific Coast population, are going to be year-round residents, and others, such as the ones that are found in the interior, are going to be more likely to be migratory, and they're going to be moving to kind of warmer areas during the winter because their habitat gets too cold. Lastly, their, their primary habitat is beaches, and this is where most of the research has been done on them. And these, these sorts of beaches are ocean fronting, they're dune, dune backed, and especially known for having low vegetation. And here is uh, just to give you an idea of what snowy clovers forage on. So, a few things that they've been identified foraging on within the San Francisco Bay includes brine floods, and here you have a picture of one that I collected and identified. Um, you also have things such as Western Tanarchus beetle, and again here is a picture that I, of what I collected, and other things such as inchworm moths. Um, aside from that, there's also a few things that have been identified as potentially prey items but have not been confirmed, and that's things such as mosquitoes, ground beetles, caterpillars, as well as amphipods. So one thing about Western snowy clovers that you need to know is that before uh, European contact here uh, on the coast, they would have had a population in the tens of thousands. Um, but currently along the Pacific coast, their population over the past uh, five years has fluctuated anywhere from around 1,500 to 1,900 individuals. So as a result of that, um, they've been uh, listed as federally threatened since 1993. They're also considered a California species of special concern, as well as having um, status in Oregon and Washington as well. Um, because of that, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has set a recovery goal for the entire Pacific Coast population of 3,000 individuals. Uh, within the San Francisco Bay Area, there's a recovery goal of 500 individuals. So it represents a pretty large portion of the recovery goal. Um, and for the Bay Area, the, the average population is around 180 individuals. So not really quite where we, we want to be with that recovery goal. And an important way that we actually assess the recovery of birds is using um, color banding. And basically what we do is use four unique color bands in order to identify individuals. And what this allows us to do is to track individuals, um, especially for uh, chicks that we ban, and to see if they fledge, to see if they survive through the winter, and it gives us an idea of how the population is doing. So right here is actually a bird that I helped to ban this year. Oh, oh again. So one of the big reasons for uh, the decline in shorebird populations, and especially snowy clovers, is due to uh, habitat loss. Um, within uh, California and within the Bay Area, there's been huge amounts of decline. So you look at the amount of habitat that was formerly found in the Bay Area, is over 220,000 hectares of tidal wetlands. I'm going to show you just how much things have changed. So you look at now the current amount of habitat that's in the Bay Area, it's drastically reduced, just fractions left of what there formerly once was. And this plays out when you look at the amount of wetlands that are currently in California. Only about 154,000 hectares, so actually less than the Bay Area once held. So keeping this in mind, um, what we see is that uh, these wetlands were turned into uh, salt ponds, and these, these large areas where salt production occurred. Um, at the same time, there was also a lot of coastal beach development happening at the end of the 18, uh, 1800s, early 1900s. Um, as I mentioned, this is where uh, most of snowy clover habitat was found. So you had snowy clovers being forced out of their primary habitat, and within the Bay Area, um, new habitat opened up. So you had snowy clovers moving into uh, salt ponds. Another big reason for um, the decline of snowy clovers is disturbance. Um, early research found that uh, snowy clovers had abandoned approximately 52 out of 80 of their breeding sites. Um, some research here in the San Francisco Bay Area saw just how much of an impact disturbance can have on nesting snowy clovers. And what this research found was that nesting birds will flush at approximately 145 meters. Um, this has a few different effects. For one, uh, the bird that's flushing can be depredated because it's creating, um, it's kind of becoming more conspicuous to predators and so it can be picked off. Um, it also causes impacts to uh, the eggs that it's, that it's incubating or to chicks um, because they're more vulnerable to uh, predation. As well, it also increases the chance that um, the bird might uh, actually, uh, that they might um, abandon the nest. And the reason for that is if the, the uh, disturbance continues for, say, even 15, 20 minutes, uh, the bird might get spooked and decide that it's just not worth it. So a lot of different issues associated with disturbance um, during the breeding season. However, there's also issues that can be associated with disturbance during the wintering season. And this research that was done down in Santa Barbara helps to show that. Um, what this study found was that um, the disturbance rates during the, win or during the winter at this um, public beach were actually 200 times higher than at a private beach nearby. And um, the reason that this is important is because 
snowy plovers need to forage a lot during the wintering season. And um, if they're not able to spend time foraging, but they're spending their time instead uh, evading disturbance, they're not going to be able to uh, spend as much time foraging, and they're going to be in poor body condition going into the breeding season. So of course, predators are a huge issue. And within the San Francisco Bay Area, there's quite a large raptor population. Um, <coughs> peregrine falcons certainly are an important one. Uh, they were formerly endangered, but have since been delisted since 1999 and are now quite a nuisance for snowy plovers. Um, we also have red-tailed hawks, northern harriers, um, that cause quite a lot of problems for snowy plovers as well. And there's also a lot of mesopredators within the Bay Area. And basically what these are, are animals that have been able to adapt to an urban lifestyle. And they're able to take advantage of an abundant food supply. Uh, things such as landfills, uh, any sort of other human refuse, they're able to live off and expand their populations. So just a few notable examples of this are red foxes. Um, these are animals that were actually introduced originally for hunting in California and have since expanded their population tremendously and caused a lot of problems for snowy plovers and other sensitive species. You also have things such as common ravens, another species that really wasn't found throughout much of California. They were kind of very sparsely populated. Um, they have since seen a population explosion in the past 15 to 20 years, coinciding with the availability of food. And you also have California gulls. And these are really notable species for the fact that um, until 1981, they actually were only a winter visitor here in the Bay Area. Um, from that time in 1981, their population grew from only about 50 breeding individuals to uh, current estimates from this season uh, put it at about 50,000 um, individuals. So quite a drastic increase. And gulls are kind of a nuisance because uh, they are very opportunistic. They will eat eggs, they will eat chicks, and they would likely eat an adult if they have a chance. So now just to give you a little bit of an idea of why I chose to study wintering plovers. Um, as I mentioned, most research has focused on the breeding season. And this makes sense. Uh, you know, this is when uh, plovers are trying to raise young, hopefully add them into the breeding population, so it's an important step to study. Um, there has been some wintering studies that have been done, um, mostly at beaches though. As I mentioned, that's their primary habitat. So not really much is known about um, in South Bay salt ponds. Um, there has been a small amount of research done here in the South Bay. Um, it's mostly just been done uh, during January, during the winter window surveys, which is kind of a week-long survey. So we have a small amount of information about plovers here in the South Bay, but it's really a missing piece of plover local life history. So now I want to get into some information about winter foraging. Winter foraging is extremely important for plovers and for all other shorebirds during the winter. And there's several reasons for this. Uh, one reason is migration. Migration requires the buildup of large fat reserves um, in order to migrate. And of course, this is before they begin, as well as also um, at stopover sites while they're migrating. It's also important because of thermoregulation. And because of how cold it gets during the winter, these birds need to build up their fat reserves in order to um, maintain their body temperature. And lastly, it's important because um, fat reserves are used as a springboard into the breeding season, and it will allow them to be more successful during the breeding season. So birds that are able to forage more effectively during the winter will uh, be more likely to produce um, offspring during the breeding season. However, because of this increased amount of foraging, there's increased raptor predation as well. And one way that snowy plovers deal with this is by the way in which they forage. And this is called the run and peck technique. Um, it allows plovers to be more vigilant and to watch out for predators. Um, it does also lower their intake rate um, so as a result, uh, because of the way in which plovers forage and also because of their, their stature, um, they have a somewhat patchy foraging habitat. And as a result, um, it's important to understand the microhabitat characteristics of where they forage for both um, management and restoration purposes. So here's a study that was done um, on beach rack in Humboldt County, um, Sandy Beaches. And for those of you who don't know, beach rack is essentially uh, washed up brown algae uh, seagrass as well as detritus. And what this study found was that winter, wintering snowy plovers were associated positively with this beach rack. Furthermore, the beach rack and, and was positively associated with invertebrates, and these invertebrates consisted of amphipods, burrowing invertebrates, and flies. And you can see here from this picture, you know, this is the beach rack line. You've got snowy plovers up and down foraging, so certainly an important um, characteristic to consider at sandy beaches. 
We've got a lot of other research from different types of shorebirds documenting the importance of microhabitat characteristics. So this study that was done along the uh, Gulf Coast of wintering piping plovers and other very closely related species uh, found that they selected for habitat that had wet substrate, substrates as well as selecting for habitat that was not near development. So even if it was good quality habitat, so uh, these piping plovers were, were avoiding these areas because of the disturbance factor. Some more research this time in California looked at restored wetlands down in Point Mugu. And what this research was looking at was how different uh, habitat characteristics would affect where different types of shorebirds would choose to forage. And the different things that they looked at were water cover, uh, habitat diversity, as well as tidal flat cover. Another study, again, in Humboldt County looked at how substrate size was related to invertebrate abundance. And what this study found was that um, amphipods were actually positively associated with sand um, substrate rather than cobble. And sand is a smaller size substrate. And furthermore, what they found was that semi-palmated plovers and ruddy turnstones were positively associated with the sand-dominated habitat. So showing that these birds were choosing to forage in these areas that had a higher abundance of invertebrates for them. Lastly, we have a study that was done here in the North Bay. Um, and this study found that seasonal variation was important to consider in where plovers might forage. And what this study found was that uh, small shorebirds, and this included uh, plovers, it included sandpipers, uh, were using baylands more in the winter. The reason for this is that uh, precipitation levels were higher, thus there was less available habitat for them in the salt ponds. But as the uh, precipitation levels went lower, as the, the ponds became drier, uh, these birds tended to use salt ponds more. The reason for this being that uh, there, in, within the salt ponds there was lower plant height and there was also an increased ability to detect predators as a result. And speaking of rap, uh, raptors, raptors are quite a significant threat. Um, the study that was done at Tyningham Estuary in Scotland really drives po that point home. And this study found that over the course of two wintering seasons, uh, the population of Dunland were reduced by 12.4% and the population of red shink were reduced by 45.6%. And this is you know, just a small case study looking at a single estuary, but it shows that um, raptors can really have a big effect on the populations of shorebirds. Now, as I mentioned, the population of raptors within the San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area is quite high, and it is possible then that uh, similar effects could be seen in plovers and other sensitive shorebirds. Um, some recent research suggests that um, adult population of plovers is actually the most significant factor for the stability of the population. So as a result, if uh, snowy plovers have a lower winter survival, this means that uh, the, the health and recovery of the population is going to be put into further doubt. So now on to my primary questions. And these were, what habitat characteristics typically characterize winter plover foraging habitat? What invertebrate species are available to wintering plovers in ponds where the birds are found and in what relative abundances? And lastly, what predator species occur at salt ponds and in what abundance? I also had a set of null hypotheses uh, to go with these. And these were moisture and substrate size at control sites do not differ from treatment sites. Insect densities at plover foraging sites and control sites do not differ. And lastly, plover behavior and flock size are not correlated with predator presence. So moving on, I had two different study sites. Uh, one was at the Don Edwards San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge. And this was mainly at uh, two different locations, one being the Ravenswood Ponds located in Menlo Park, and also at the Warm Springs Ponds located next to Fremont. And then the, the site where I spent the majority of my time was Eden Landing Ecological Reserve. And this is located next to Hayward and Union City, just south of Highway 92. I'm going to show you just kind of get an idea of what these ponds look like. Um, so here on the left, we have pond R3. Um, this is next to Facebook, so some of you might be familiar with it. Um, and this pond is, is kind of, it's really interesting looking. It's very, very salty. It's almost got a sort of moonscape look to it. Um, it's got a lot of texture, a lot of good cover for plovers, and it's definitely an important pond for plovers. Um, on the right here, we have pond E14. And this is actually the most productive pond within the South Bay for plovers, um, both during the breeding season and, as I found, it's also very important during the wintering season. And as a result, there's been a lot of restoration and enhancement work done on the site. So now moving on to my data collection. So my season one uh, started December 2013, went through March 2014. My second season was again the same time frame, December through March 2015. I visited ponds approximately three times per week. And early on in the season especially, I conducted reconnaissance. And what I would do is I would go out, I would go out uh, 
scan sample all ponds for plovers and predators using a spotting scope and binoculars. And especially important to this was that I would be, be surveying systematically to determine uh, where there was available uh, habitat for plovers. The reason for this is that conditions tend to change quite a bit within ponds, both um, between seasons and within seasons. So um, they might change because of precipitation, it might change because of different management for different types of birds, and it also may have changed because of restoration um, activities. So um, I want to make it clear that there were two different areas that I identified during my project. There were areas that I, that I saw plovers foraging. These are the areas that I termed treatment. And then I also had areas where I didn't observe plovers foraging, but that seemed to be good quality habitat. Um, and these are areas that I termed control sites. So now to my observation component. When I did actually observe plovers foraging, I would record them on the map. I would then record their behavior for every five minutes for a total of 30 minutes. And I would record whether or not they were roosting or foraging. During this time, I'd also record the shorebird species that were within 25 meters. And I would also record any predator presence that I observed during this time I was out in the ponds. So another huge component of my project was microhabitat sampling. And for areas where I observed plovers foraging, I would make sure to get out there, um, or back out there within about 48 hours to minimize the amount of difference in the habitat. And so what I would do is I would set up a seven meter radius circle at these sites where I observed plovers foraging. Um, I'd actually set up four of them in order to subsample um, the location a little bit better and average everything out. Um, and the things that I measured at these sites were uh, total plant cover, plant height, soil moisture, soil sample, I would uh, gather invertebrate abundance, and I would also take the distance